Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Howard Redwood with Olivia, and uh, we have uh, a guest today, Stephen Ramsden, who's uh, a B plus E trainer. Uh, whereabouts in the country are you, Steve? Um, I'm in North Lincolnshire, halfway between Doncaster and Scunthorpe. Okay, and I know uh, Steve's got a lot of experience of doing um, this type of training and is uh, in constant con converse conversations with the DVSA on certain aspects of doing this training as well. So we've invited Steve to come along and help answer questions that we have. Um, so today we're talking about B plus E. Um, if you've got your driving licenses handy, that's reasonably good because uh, we can have a look on the licenses and see exactly where B plus E stands in the, in the standards of uh, driving hierarchy, so to speak. So uh, Olivia, and I think we've got Tom in the background as well. So Olivia will be in the background doing things and Stephen and I will uh, answer your questions and go through these slides. Stephen and I have uh, been uh, looking at these during the week. So uh, we'll just carry on with the, with the information that it contains, if that's all right with you. Any questions you have, please put in the questions box. Any chats that you have, because some people chat amongst each other, uh, we'll monitor the chats as well. But if all questions really need to go in the question box, please. It's easier for us if we just, uh, monitoring the question box and I can answer more information for you. Okay, so if you want to move on to the next slide, please, uh, Olivia. Okay, thank you. So what are we trying to establish today? Well, first thing, simple question really, what is B plus E training? Um, the B plus E training, E stands for trailers. So it's putting trailers of certain sizes and maximum weights on the back of cars and towing them. So it's um, the sort of car and, car and uh, trailer, caravan towing, horse boxes, etc., uh, can be done in many areas. Um, Lantra, border, even those sort of places, the forestry commission people, etc., all need this. And so do some of the emergency services as well. Anybody who's uh, camping, towing, um, horse boxes, etc., need to do it. We're gonna go and establish who is able to do the training for it, what equipment is required, which is where Steve will help us with that as well. And what you need to know uh, to get involved with B plus E and some of the information that's required that if you do become a trainer or are a trainer, um, certain information that's required or if you're just interested, what's required for uh, test standards, et cetera, MTV regulations, et cetera. Okay, so if you could move on, please, Olivia. There we go. Okay. Got the animations around Howard. As I say, yeah, that's okay. a stand yeah. out job. <laughs> yeah, the colour of hair, I think, is what it is, Olivia. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, no, you put these slides together. Don't start on me today. <laughs> right. B plus E training. Okay, so um, B plus E. Uh, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about this at all? Um, yeah, as, as it's kind of saying up there, if you passed your test um, before the 1st of January 1997, you basically have what we refer to as grandfather rights, which would be giving you the, the full ability to tow um, the trailer that you, you want to uh, behind a suitable vehicle. Uh, after that um, test date um, on the 1st of January 1997, uh, you, the restrictions came in. Uh, and then that's going to limit the size of trailer that you can actually tow, even if you've got the B&E. But to be honest, in a way, it's kind of a little bit irrelevant because a few years ago, they actually did stipulate that you can't put more than three and a half tons on a tow ball anyway. So where it's saying there you can tow trailers over the size, um, you can't anyway now unless you've got specialist coupling systems. Yeah, the um, point we had here, Steve, was, uh, was the accidents that were being caused with um, before the 19th of January, where trailers were allowed to go on vehicles of any size. It meant if someone was towing behind an empty transit van, for example, the three and a half ton or whatever ton trailer on the back was usually heavier than the towing vehicle. And it was causing snaking, it was causing um, jackknifing, etc., on the roads. And uh, this, this was happening between the 1st of January 97 and the 19th of January 2013 was why it was changed to say that the trailer could only be a maximum of three and a half tonnes and that was it. But yeah. up to that time the police were having a hell of a time with the, uh, with the roads uh, and you're quite right but the, but the 1st of January 97 the 8,250 kilos the grandfather rights exceeds into category C1 which is obviously a heavier towing vehicle so 
it's quite a quite a difference in the weights in those days. Have you have, do you have any experience of um, when you go to test though, Steve, of having to categorise people who've taken their test at different times? Oh, sorry, no. taken their uh, driving test at different times and different stipulations with the driving tests. No, actually, it, they don't really look into it to that deeply, to be honest. Um, generally speaking, the Category B licence will act as the uh, provisional entitlement. But that's something, again, that is worth checking. But you'll find out when you try and book the test anyway, because it won't allow you to book it. But we've come across a scenario. There seemed to be a snapshot of drivers uh, who passed, and they didn't actually have it added on as a provisional entitlement, in which case then, they have to reapply to DVLA to get it added before you can book them in for the B&E test. Um, as in terms of turning up for the test, as long as they're holding a, a valid card and they've got the test booked, then the examiners seem pretty happy and don't look any further into it. Mm, it's a bit of a minefield, I do know. I mean, the, uh, the situation with um, the towing vehicles and the construction use regulations, I think is also a a minefield that's not really looked into properly. Um, yeah. I think the BDSA slip up there where some of the, I mean, you and I had this conversation last week about the, the size of vehicles that turn up to tests, which are, you, we, you and I can see the experience we have that these vehicles are far too small. It's not, not enough power in them to tow the trailers when they've got the loads that are regard, required by the DVSA uh, for the test, for the MTV regulations. Um, smallish cars going up with trailers at 800 kilos, one tonne in weight. If you were to look at the logbook and it's where, where you find your maximum amount of towing capability on these vehicles, on the towing vehicle, can be found on the vehicle logbook on the V5 in both um, braked trailer weight, which is normally a trailer up to 750 kilos, which you can tow on a car license, normal category B license normally, but it also has on the V5 uh, logbook, the unbraked weight mass that's allowed to be towed by that vehicle as well. And um, for some of these small vehicles, that is very small. And yeah. I don't think does meet the MTV regulations for DVSA, but where's the monitoring of the DVSA's B plus E testing system? I, it, do you see it very often? Do you see it being monitored? Anyone actually supervising those? No, I mean, I've questioned this before, because obviously, if you've got um, Joe Bloggs down the road trying to do it on the cheap, then they will basically set up with what they have available. And um, I have commented to the uh, technical standards branch and people like that, that there's people are using incorrect vehicles. Excuse me. So the, um, the towing weights are exceeded. Um, but they they do look into it, but they came back with the answer, well, they assured us it wasn't. They didn't actually look into it themselves. Um, and just the example you gave earlier, you said transit van. Now, that's quite a surprising one. Again, a certain age group of small transit vans um, could only pull a weight of 650 kilograms uh, on their plated weight. So it was actually quite low standards on, on the manufacturers of the vehicles. So it's, it is going to be a minefield, but it's something that possibly looking at changing. Yeah, I understand that uh, there's going to be a, a, quite a few changes coming in next year. Now we've left, now we've actually uh, left Europe. Um, we've got uh, an issue where um, situations of um, commercial vehicles, the, I don't think weight limits are changing on anything like Arctics and lorries, but the equipment required to travel abroad there's got to be more specifications on things like towing trailer, any trailer. Uh, all trailers going to uh, Europe have got to be registered with the DVSA. And I think they've got to do that before the end of this month. I think it's the end of this month for anybody towing anything across Europe fr from the 1st of January 2021. Uh, all trailers have got to be registered with the DVSA and be given a serialised number. So uh, yeah. otherwise they can't leave the port. No. Uh, so that's and that includes B plus E. It's not just uh, not just Arctic's and C one E and D and D one E. It's you know it's uh, it's to do with uh, B plus E trailers as well. Yeah, I know Tony just put up a bit of information there where he says that the towing weights aren't always on the V five, which is correct. Um, so but the rough rule of, on the older V fives are not. Sorry, on the older V fives, they're not. On the newer ones, they are. Okay. 
Um, but another way to check it anyway is to use the uh, vehicle identification plate because that will show you its gross train weight and the vehicle gross weight and you just deduct one from the other and what's left is basically what it can tow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you deduct one from the other, that's right, yeah, yeah. And uh, then, then you have to check your construction use regulations on your car as well to ensure that um, it will, you know, they obviously meet up. So you can have a, you can have a, um, a plating weight on the trailer, but you still got to check the car itself to make sure that that parameter does meet. Uh, and this is where I think we get trainers who go up to the B plus C who haven't got the knowledge of all these numbers. They, they see the trailer is suitable for the test and they don't look at the, the, ca the, the caliber of the towing vehicle for it. It's almost like it's irrelevant. I yeah. Before. As long as you physically don't take them over that weight, then uh, DVSA aren't bothered. No. Um, but it's obviously, you know, again, you, you've got to make sure your vehicle is up to it. Yeah. Okay. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay. Now, in order to do B plus E, um, obviously, it's, uh, there's got to be some checks done with Swansea. The phone system with Swansea, the uh, 0800 number or the 0906 number that's uh, you can usually phone them up if you are a fleet worker um, and want to get the license validated by Swansea. That system's not working. It uh, has been closed, I think, since about April time. Um, and so it means you need to go online to do the driver check information to ensure that um, the, the, if you're going to be doing B plus E training, that the, calib that the person has got the it actually has a, a category B license, it's valid, they're not banned from driving, etc. Just because uh, you are taking them out on B plus E, if they're banned in category B, obviously they can't do the testing. So uh, in any in any category. So it's, it does need license verification if you are wishing to become a trainer and want to know what you've got to do. It, it, licenses have to be checked before you do any training at all, make sure. And what you require for someone is the last eight characters of their driving license um, number um, and the check code from the pupil. Um, they, to get the code, need to have their national insurance number when they go onto the DVLA website with their driver number. And I think it's the date of birth and postcode they've got to put in as well. That will generate them a code they can give to you, but you still need the um, last eight characters of their driver number and uh, the license check code to be able to check their license online. Yeah. And that gets you around ICO and GDPR and everything else. Um, if you're checking a license in the car because you've, you've, you've seen the license code, but you want to actually visibly check the license, remember there are COVID re regulations and really and truly try to avoid holding the license get them to hold it up to you so you can read it, get them to turn it over so you can see the starting validity date of B plus E on their license if you're doing fleet work with them, etc. cetera. Um, but try not to take the license from them. Um, the license code they give you is now valid for 21 days. It used to be seven days. It got increased like three years ago to 21 days. Um, and the code can only be used once. So if they generate a code and they've given that to a hire vehicle company the day before, the code won't work for you because it's been spent. So they have to have a separate code for each license check. So if they're going to a hire company to hire a vehicle to do the training with you, et cetera, or whatever, then they'll have to have a code for you to check their license and it'd be a separate code for the hire company. So if we could move on, please. So who can train B plus E? Um, let's first of all talk about who can drive B plus E. You can tow trailers at the age of 17. Um, and if I'm right, Steve, there's no separate theory test for B plus E. It's all encompassed in the category B uh, yeah. theory test for cars, isn't it? Yeah, it's just an extension of the B. So all you have to do is literally get a test book. There are um slightly different vehicle safety check questions because obviously the the b ones changed a couple of years ago so you were actually do some on the move all the b and e ones are static and there are three questions within that that relate to the trailer um so again it's all on go if you want to print it off and read through it um and uh, that's the only real difference 
Okay, talking about training B plus E, information that came to light this morning. Now, you'd be expected, if you are not an ADI, you are able to train B plus E. Now, it's a bit of a can of worms, this, which Steve will have to help me out with here. We've got a situation with um, the um, derogations that were set up by the European Union, and there are three directives. The third directive came into force in 2013. And B plus E was the only category that was missed completely off the third directive. And therefore, there is no register for trainers. I mean, LGV is a voluntary register. Okay, it's, there's a register, it's monitored by the um, vocational training people and also RTITB. But there yeah. is no official um, DV SA register for um, B plus E. Um, no. They don't come under the ADI register for category B either. So you don't have to be an ADI to train B plus E. However, there's two things to be careful of. If you're not an ADI, then you have to be 21 years old minimum and have held the B plus E license for three years or a higher plus E category for three years, okay, before you can train B plus E. Because it's not the B that's the problem, it's the E that's the problem. So you've changed your car from what's generally a social, domestic and pleasure insurance and usage into a more commercial usage. And that is why there has to be three years. However, what came to light this morning, the driving and motorcycle riding instructors recognition of EU professional qualification regulations 2016. There's a pub quiz question for you, isn't there? That has come into force uh, in 2016, which means that ADIs who have been on the register, who are fully, fully, not PDIs, ADIs, are able to waive the three years. Okay, so they can have the grandfather rights for B plus E, and they're allowed to do license acquisition on B plus E, and they do not have to take a B plus E test because they are an ADI. The ADI, the, the category B side of the ADI register allows them to do the training because the, um, the qualification of being an ADI uh, puts them in a better stead for hazard awareness, perception, and um, coaching, coaching skills. So there's a derogation there effectively for um, an ADI to be able to train um, B plus E, uh, providing they are 21, they can train it if they have um, B plus E on their license uh, from grandfather rights, they can do B plus E training, but um, an ADI is, is allowed to go in, an ADI who hasn't got B plus E has to take B plus, let's just straighten this up. A, the B plus E test must be taken, but does not have to be held for three years if the hold of the category B is an ADI. That's what I'm trying to say. If yeah. you've got the grandfather rights, you are allowed to train B plus E without being an ADI, providing you've held the grandfather rights for three years or more and you are 21 years old, which anybody who's got the grandfather rights would be older than 21 anyway, because you're going back to a license that came into force on the 1st of January, 19, uh, before the 31st December, 1996. So you'll, you'll be over 21 anyway. So, but you do not, the essence is you do not need to be an ADI to train B plus E, but it's that 2016 regulation, the, the legislation, uh, which means that any European ADI, and this is the only category they can do it in, any European ADI is able to come over from Europe and train B plus E without having to do anything at all to change their qualification from the category that they are trained in in their native country because B plus E was missed off the European Third Directive. What a bloody mess. Well, at least that's not complicated then. No, it's not. No, so we, we, you and I are going to stand no problem at all, don't we? Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's uh, it is a, a, a right mess. Um, we've got ourselves in a bit of a puddle, um, but so is most of Europe. Uh, I don't know anything much about a fourth European directive, but I know that the Department for Transport have always said that this is one of the main things that will get tidied up whenever they get parliamentary time at the end of COVID. 
there's a load of things to sort out and B plus E is going to be one of them. Have you got anything to add on that? Um... <laughs> no, no, I think you pretty much cleared that up. I, I don't want to interject, that's too complicated. It's too, okay, fine. <laughs> but you, are, you, are you aware of the 2016 regulations there though, uh, Steve? No, I've not heard of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously- with... like This morning, I only found out this morning, it's somebody sent it into me this morning. No, I mean, obviously, with what I've been an ADI since 1999 anyway, so um, it's never really affected me. No, 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 indeed. Yeah. Okay. Right, so situation, if we could change slides, please. Okay, so if you want to go through this then, Steve, if you would, please, about the equipment that's required um, for, for B plus E. Yeah, so the, the top bit there, a suitable Category B vehicle. So obviously it's going to depend on how much you want to put into this really in terms of uh, setting yourself up. Uh, whether you can find a car that's going to be suitable for you to do driving instruction in and do the B&E test, that's, uh, that's a possibility. But the, the rumours are that they're, they're going to have to be, for B&E, a vehicle and trailer that is a proper B&E category because at the moment you can get away without doing that. Um, so that has to be suitable. You've got to think as well, kind of really the terrain that you work in too. Um, I'm fairly lucky because of where I am with my two test centers that I use, um, the ground is actually pretty flat. Um, I do use a four wheel drive anyway, um, but uh, you go to somewhere like Sheffield where it appears they actually plow their roads. Um, you need something that's quite substantial to drag the trailers up the hill there as well. Um, so a lot of the smaller towing vehicles would suffer quite a lot of wear and tear on that basis. Um, you still kind of, again, we're still stuck at the moment with B&E where we have to be manual or automatic. Again, this is something I'm trying to pressure them to change because if they want to move us into the realms of electric and hybrid vehicles, which have been in the news recently, um, they're going to have to change the legislation and to find a decent suitable towing vehicle manual alternatives are actually getting pretty thin on the ground um, so that's one of the things i'd like to see to change but the car itself uh, doesn't need to be dual controlled you do need to have extra mirrors on the outside for the examiners to use and um, other than that um, as long as it is a category b vehicle i'm not aware of any that would class as unsuitable as long as they can tow the trailers uh, the trailer itself is a minimum of a one ton plated maximum authorised mass trailer um, and again this is something again if they ever started picking up on it um, it does actually state that it must be plated at that so if the plate's fallen off um, get another one put back on because again they could refuse it at test um, but I've never seen that happen to other people. Um, the, the real total mass um, uh, of the vehicle has to be at least 800, and we're talking about this with Howard the other day. Um, the two actually don't really work together very well now, because with the, the ballast load that you've got to put in it, um, your trailer's going to be way heavier than one ton, or needs to be heavier than one ton anyway. So you've got to account for that in what your trailer can actually hold. Um, so... The, the ballast that you can put in can be aggregates in bags, um, 10 kilogram minimum, and it has to be marked with the weights on the bags, but you can actually do that with a felt tip. Um, so they're kind of probably relying on a little bit of honesty. And um, the thing is, once you put the bags inside, they do get lighter because they dry out. Or you can use an intermediate um, bulk container, so it's IBC, not UBC, um, of 600 litres or 1,000. Um, I just use the water because it's easier to handle and as long as the container is actually fully full you don't get the problem with it sloshing around uh, and affecting the vehicle. The trailer itself, um, the size wise and dimension wise, uh, it has to be basically as wide as the towing vehicle and it actually says at least as high as the towing vehicle as well in the literature. Um, but again I've seen people going in with ones that are actually shorter than the towing vehicles but the examiners seem to be of the philosophy, as long as it's blocking out the rear view out of the vehicle, then that's okay. Um, in terms of securing the weights down inside of it, uh, the examiners now are allowed to um, look in to see if they are secured down. 
Um, so you must make sure the load is secured properly using straps, uh, retaining bars, whatever's basically going to keep it secure and won't let it move. Um, and again, it's something that will refuse to take vehicles out on test if things aren't secured properly, which luckily, if all of us are doing it properly and professionally, should not be an issue. Um, L plates only have to be on the very front of the towing vehicle and then on the very rear of the trailer. Um, other than that, um, I think that covers about anything, everything on that. So the situation then, um, Steve, if you no, know, we were talking about the 2013 split in the licenses. Yeah. When it comes to testing, um, if, the, if an examiner does actually pick up that you've got someone of a different age, therefore they should be towing a different size or weight trailer, does the DVSA examiner then have to change the size of the manoeuvring park on the test? Ah, right. No, I mean, um, yeah, if you turn up with something that's a different length, so you need to know the total length of your, your car and trailer. Um, to be fair, even the grumpy examiners wear a go. You just literally tell them five minutes before you, the test is due to start, oh, I've brought this vehicle and it's actually this long, and they will go out and just man alter the manoeuvring area. Right, okay. Um, they will actually do that for you then. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, a bugbear for me with that is that it does stipulate that the bay that you reverse into should be one and a half times the width of your tow of your combination. Mm. Um, but they never measure that. They never even ask you how wide it is. So if you've got a particularly wide trailer, you lose mm. a little bit of maneuvering space. Mm. Uh, and this is again, something that they need to start sharpening up on. Yeah, I remember you talking to me about um, way they actually measure the widths between cones, uh, the difference of a between yeah. the and a fail could be whether they measure the cones between the tops of the cones or whether they measure from the bottom of the base. Yeah, I, yeah, I asked that question again to technical standards and I got told not to be so pedantic, basically. Yeah, and it's tough because, I mean, it does mean a lot of difference to a lot of people. The space, it depends on whether they are saying about the indicators touching the cone, which is part of the vehicle, or whether it's the wheels going over the base of the cone. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you, it's, that, it's that different. I mean, a, a trainer depends... A driver, depending on how they're trained and how they've been on a test on a, on a practicing ground, it can make all the difference of a pass and a fail. You know, so yeah. it's got to be standardised, and that's one of the things that you've got a bit of a pet hate about at the moment. You don't, you think that there should be a, a tightening up on the legislation on that. Yeah, they, they should clarify it basically. That that's all we're really asking for. So when we're practicing, we know what we're aiming to do. Um, the base of the cones. I mean, you can actually run over the foot of the cone. Um, the, but the trouble is now with the modern ones that are usually made out of a hard plastic, they tend to go off like tiddlywinks if you touch them. Yeah. The older ones used to stay where they were, and you just get a minor fault for that happening. Um, yeah. Someone just put up that it is from the base of the cone. Um, yeah. But again, they don't come out and measure it. So when you've got a six and a half foot wide trailer compared to a five foot, that's quite a lot of space you're losing. Yeah, yeah, it is indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, if you could. And this is uh, what you need to know. Um, Steve's pretty much gone through some of the MTV regulations. Um, the MTV regulations, the minimum test vehicle requirement regulations is what that means, MTV. So we're looking at uh, ensuring that uh, the driver can see round the um, trailer by having the appropriate mirrors. So they've got to know what mirrors, they need to know the width and length of the trailer as, as uh, Steve has mentioned. And there is a minimum speed capability the DVSA insists. Now, I can't remember if it's 52 miles per hour, though it's 58, Steve. Do you remember which one it is? Vehicles um, no, I've got a feeling it's 52, but yeah, don't quote me on that. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. I think I looked up last week and I got a feeling it's 52. So the vehicle must be capable of travelling at 52 miles per hour on, a, on a, a reasonable road, towing the trailer that is going to test with its... MTV load, the DVSA require for test regulations, must be able to do 52 miles per hour. Um, also, the construction use regulations, 1986, which curtail the towing vehicles, towing ca capabilities. Um, it mustn't it really, the, the no car should go to test um, towing more than the capability of the vehicle. And I, I'm surprised that um, the DVSA aren't stricter on that because if you've got effectively not as I was saying illegal I suppose it is illegal for towing a, uh, a vehicle that's not 
suitable for the towing vehicle. If a towing a trailer is not suitable for a towing vehicle, then that vehicle shouldn't be on the road and breaks MOT regulations and possibly operating license regulations and goodness as what else. Well, so, it, it probably could invalidate the insurance as well because yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, right yeah. for the road. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, so, to, be, to be fair, the DAF doing it because most of the test stations are at the DVSA old Vosa sites. So if they ever cotton onto it, they could just start weighing axles. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, looking at the trailers and finding out, yeah, actually, you shouldn't be doing that. They're big fines. They are well, uh, axle weight uh, fines are massive. Something could be two and a half grand. Yeah, three yeah, points. Yeah, 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 depends on what you're over. Yeah, yeah. So license restrictions um, with the the DVSA's uh, B plus E test. Now I clarified this with the with the DVSA only uh, two weeks ago. If you take your um, test on B plus E in an automatic regardless of whether you took your driving test in your car on a manual, you'd still be restricted to B plus E automatic. You wouldn't be allowed to do, you, you, just because you took your driving test in the car, which was manual, it doesn't overwrite the automatic on the B plus E. So whatever you take it in on a B plus E is what is restricted on the license for the B plus E category. It's not quite the same for class two licenses, which is the LGV and the PCV licenses. Um, it's a different uh, rule and regulation there. Yeah. But on B plus E, it is if you take it in automatic on a B plus E, regardless of what you took your driving test in, you would be restricted to automatic on a B plus E um, category on your license. So either 70 on your license. Uh, yeah, 70 on your license. Can I, can I just interject to that point yeah, as well? Yeah. Just, just something else. Um, if you actually took your original car test in a manual, in a, sorry, in an automatic car, and then you go in and do your B and E test in a manual B and E, they will upgrade your car license. Yes, they will. They do it the other way around. That's Jesse Dars told yeah. that. To me. Yes, they will. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you do one question here about load security, Steve, when you actually do your test for B plus E, what are the fastings they require? I mean, obviously not going to use chains on bags of concrete, you know, bags of bags of stone. So what are they looking for? Ratchet straps or can it just be roped in? Um, ratchet ones? straps are best because they're rated. Yeah. Um, your problem is with rope. Um, you don't truly know how much load it can hold. Right. Um, so that's, again, the other advantage of using an IBC. And to be honest, if I was going to use sandbags, I would empty out an IBC and put it in that yeah. and fill in the bags yeah. because then it's just easier to secure. Um, yeah. So the trailer has tie down points inside. And um, when you buy your ratchet straps, there'll be a blue label on them, which tells you the, um, the fixing strength of them. Um, and then you just make sure it's greater than the load you're trying to fasten down, which to be honest with 600 kilograms is pretty easy to do. Yeah. Um, but they're not expensive. Uh, I think it's £15 for a pair. Yeah. So I've got two pairs. So I've got one over the top, one front, one back. So theoretically, that load is not going to move. Yeah. Um, again, the well, when we originally started with B&E, it was only the senior examiners that were allowed to look in the trailers. But they have now, uh, or actually just before lockdown one, um, they started asking the candidates, is the load secure? Um, so you train the candidate to say yes. Um, if the candidate says no or don't know, then the examiner is entitled to go and look to see if they think it's secured. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when we're talking about that, I suppose really when we're going back to a slide that said, what equipment do you need? If you are going to have this stuff, for example, you might go down to, to start with and go to a B&Q and go and buy your aggregate on a pallet then rather than hand board that stuff off to empty the trailer, you might need some sort of machine to be able to unload your trailer on the pallet. So it's not just a question of car, trailer and fastenings, etc. If you're going to use that trailer for something else outside work, you want to be able to empty it reasonably quickly, reasonably easily, unless you've got a, a company nearby you that's quite willing to come out and offload you and unload you again. So there's that to consider as well, I suppose, too. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, that's, that's again so with the water because when, when I'm not using it, just empty it and then the, the container, it's awkward to move but it's not that heavy 
No. I just um, handball it somewhere out of yeah. the way, and then I've got my trailer back if I want to put something else in it. Yeah, okay. Now we've got a, a bullet point here with tachograph regulations. It is a case where um, tachographs are required for any vehicle that's over three and a half tons. So, so if your combination becomes 3,501 kilos, believe it or not, if you're moving the vehicle for um, commercial gain, then you have to have a tachograph either yeah. for the vehicle or it's got to be done at the moment under manual regulations. You can be on domestic rules or you can be on European rules. It doesn't matter whether you're on, on either, but, uh, and I believe it's 2023, um, any vehicle, any driver that is under tachograph regulations will have to operate using an ST2 tachograph machine. They will not allow to be doing manual uh, entries unless that machine is open. Yeah, for training though, we don't need to use the tachographs though. No, you don't. But so anybody, we don't have to have them fitted. No, anybody who's driving with it though, I mean, yeah. the trainers need to know about tachograph regulations because the people, the end user they'll be training will probably need to use tachos at some time or other. Yeah, the, so, again, that is another massive grey area um, yeah. or where people are prepared to just simply risk it because the amount of people that um, you, do, you will potentially teach with this uh, they'll say, yeah, we're using it to move, uh, uh, be a builder, or move scrap cars around, which is a big common thing near me. Yeah. Um, and you say to them, yeah, you do realise you fall under TACA regulations now and operator licence regs. Yeah, yeah. And they go, oh, well, no, we're not bothering with that. I yeah. mean, at the end of the day, that's their choice. Yeah. All you can do is advise. Yeah. With the operator's regulations, I mean, if you go on to discuss um, operator regulations, uh, operating licences, are you able to do that, Steve? Yeah, uh, I mean, I do actually work with operators and uh, I'm a transport manager for different companies. Um, so I've got a bit of base knowledge on this. Um, hopefully a little bit more than base knowledge, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I mean, tachograph regs. Um, again, if uh, people do want to know further about it, uh, there's a publication called GV262. Um, and if you Google that, it's, it's on the .gov site, I think, as well, mm -hmm. or you used yeah, to be able so to download it yeah. and book yeah. on that. Um, that will explain most of the regulations to them in terms of uh, who's in scope of the rules, which rules you can follow, uh, and then complying with the regulations once the driver's passed. But also as well, you've got to think things like, well, they'll need to have a, a tachograph card as well, so a digital mm -hmm. card that goes in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the operator, the license holder, he will have a company card which allows them to download data. And again, this is another thing. A lot of this is mentioned in GV262. And there is a further publication, which is a guide to operators, which basically talks through the whole procedure. But it starts out with things like keeping records on vehicles for 15 months, um, actually applying for the license in the first place, whether you need restricted standard or international licenses, um, depending what you're going to use the vehicles for. Um, but if you have knowledge of this, uh, which uh, you know you may do from previous jobs, it is quite a lucrative side in, in terms of uh, talking to these people and these companies to get them up to speed so they're not going to get in trouble with the traffic commissioner. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about traffic commissioners, I think it was last week on last week's webinar, which you, I don't know if you were there or not, Steve, but... Nah. Uh, when those when those traffic commissioners come in, there's only I think there's only eight of them around the country. Yeah. Um, and if one of those comes and visits a, a, an operating site uh, because of um, problems that have been reported, they don't turn up for tea and cakes. You know, they don't come out of Krispy Kreme donuts. They are they are there. They'll go through everything. And if they don't like what they see, they send in Vosa. And that's regardless of whether you're category B plus E, whether you're C, whether you're category D, doesn't matter what it is they will go to town with you and then you start getting um, orders put on you for compliance. And if you yeah. don't comply at the right time, then it can be closure and serious, serious fines as well. So operating licenses um, are really quite serious things. They have to be adhered to. Um, and even uh, lots of tachograph infringements can create them to come in and inspect the operator licenses because the operator license holder is responsible for all driving hours and working time directives. So they've got to make sure brakes are taken in time, et cetera. But one question I've got for you, Steve, because we're talking about B plus E here, we don't normally associate B plus E with CPC, the Certificate of Professional Competence. 
but I understand it. And I'm not I'm not sure if I'm right here, but if you've got to get a digi card, a digital tachograph card, you've got to have 35 hours or the initial CPC, have you not? No, no, you don't. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, it, when you, uh, if you look on drought to regulate that side of it, yeah, um, it yeah. yeah, they they stipulate that it's basically a C1 or a D1 yeah. or above. Okay. So, so B, B and E's just below the radar. Right, okay. So it's only the DQC, the digital qualification card that you get with the CPC. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. um, right. And this is actually why, again, I mean, some some companies will, will go for the B's and E's rather than the what yeah. would term as the seven and a half ton as the C ones because yeah. it actually keeps them easier to run. Yeah, yeah, in many respects, probably a bit more yeah. on, the, on the old um, cost for uh, for um, actual running costs are probably high. If you you're looking at at a, a vehicle that's probably much on its maximum maximum pulling unit whereas yeah. the arctics and the uh you know there's the protecticans and the and the rigids where they can tow some quite some some decent stuff can't they yeah yeah okay definitely. right I, 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 is there anything else on me you want to add to that, steve because I, I think we've come to the questions bit now i think i think um no no i i think i think that's kind of it really isn't it um it was very much, I mean, I started doing these in 2007 and I read my regulations and made sure I was absolutely right before I went in. Mm -hmm. And then the learning curves when you start trying to teach it to find yeah. out what the examiners want from it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've got some questions. You want to go on to the question side, Olivia, if you would, please. Okay. Uh, we've got um, it's a question that John Dixon is saying about the um, allocations of trainer booking tests. Um, just general before, uh, how, how does CVSA decide on test allocations via trainer booking um, when right. BSC is being booked? Right, basically the work on the, um, so if we take today's date, I went on and booked my ones this morning. Um, the look at your past four week um, attendance for tests, if you like, that you've booked through the trainer booking system and they take an average of that against the number of slots that are allocated in the 10 weeks ahead, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and yes, uh, it's a pain in the backside because I have got customers waiting. I could do these every day of the week for them for as far as I could, but I can only get two test slots a week. Right, okay. Yeah. That's not a lot. If you've got trainers working for you and you've got two or three trainers going out at the same time, well, there's there's a, there's a bit of um uh, i mean I, I assume everyone's aware of customer sites where if you've got a base where you can set up and do b and e yourself you can have an examiner go there for the day yes yeah and uh they're still getting their full allocation for that day and they yes. are still allowing them to take tests away from the test centers yeah i forgot what they call those examiners it begins with a what's they call them um uh. I can think of a few beginning with A, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Won't go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so uh, John, who's, a, I believe, is a B plus E trainer as well. Uh, we were talking earlier on, you mentioned uh, something about the uh, show me, tell me questions being three around the trailer and also uh, others that are static. Um, John has said that uh, sometimes the examiners will come off grid uh, from their printed show me, tell me. Oh, he said uh, he had a client that was asked to name 10 things that would be illegal when towing the trailer. Have you come across that before on the on the that, test? Yeah, we have one that he, he seems to have two favourite questions, which is the power steering. And uh, when he's asking about clearing the windscreen, uh, he's, he starts talking about chips in the screen. Yeah. Um, where actually it's just the washer jets. Um, we bite our tongue on it to be honest, um, because we actually have quite a good relationship with the examiners at the test centre. But if it was ever the miner that broke the camel's back, then we would be going for it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, but yes, they do deviate away from it a yeah. little bit. And this is, again, the problem is they don't seem to know what they're doing with B&E all the time. No, well, it's not on the directive. You see, there's no... I, I know when you go to the ADI one for testing of, sorry, not ADI one, so the DT one for doing driving tests, there seems less information in there on B plus C than anything else. 
Yeah. Like it's uh, oh, we better do something. Oh, let's put this down. It looks like that in the in the documents. It really does. Right, yeah. I've got uh, um, Howard. Um, he says uh, I'm an ADI. I have B plus C grandfather rights. So do I need to pass the test in order um, in order to do B plus C training and not have to hold it for three years? Yes, that's correct. If you're an ADI and you have B plus C grandfather rights, Howard, then you can straight away the, the, the three years is waived for you. You can do B plus C, but as long as you've taken on board what Steve has said about the regulations on vehicles, equipment you need, uh, it's not, it's not, oh great, I've got another stream of revenue. There's a bit of outlay to pay for all the stuff you've got to get. These trades. Uh, uh, sorry, just just one thing as well, thinking just equipment. I was thinking about this last night. Um, one of the hardest bits I found with this is finding a suitable area to practice the the reverse because you need a big area. Hmm. The, the reverse area is 11 meters wide and then four times your combination length forward. Mm -hmm. So if you rock up down to Morrison's and suddenly start setting now that up, hmm. they can come along and just tell you, go away. Yeah. This is our space. So yeah. you, you kind of need to research who's around you, who's got a bit of land. Um, and, you know, you maybe even end up just paying a little nominal fee to go on. Um, and uh, yeah, and if they suddenly change their mind, you've got to have backup plans because otherwise you're fairly scuppered. Well, there's also the other thing they can do rather than actually go into buying all their own equipment is the LGV training companies. They sometimes delve into B plus C, but the LGV trainers, they normally need a, a, a five day um, training yeah. regime and B plus C needs three. So they aren't going to have a trainer sitting around for two days if they've done a B plus E that week. They can't start an LGV session for two days. And therefore, they might ask an ADI to go in for them who's got the experience and the competence to use, that they might be able to go in and use that site on the days when the LGVs are on the road. And yeah. That's the possibility to go there and do it then. It and certainly does well to get friendly with some. Yeah, yeah. It's possible they could do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, John, any sign of B plus of private B plus C tests stopping? They don't get checked for legality of required weights when they turn up. But it appears, John, that that's the same pretty much anywhere. The DBSA tends to take your your um, uh, word for it that the aggregates on there are all in the same size bags. That I know they're not allowed to be in different weight bags. If you've got 10 kilo bags, they've all got to be 10 kilo bags. 20 kilo bags, they've all got to be 20 kilo bags. So if an examiner looks in the back and sees different size bags there, they break the MTV, simple as that. So um, although you might say you don't get checked, if they are turning up privately um, and they've got the wrong stuff in the back and the examiner sees it, then, um, then it's a, a situation where uh, they can, uh, I believe, can be refused. To yeah, because they, I've seen that happen. Yeah. 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 Um, the wrong wrong type of weight, um, things like that as well. Um, so, yeah, they, they, they will kind of, particularly I think with the private ones, they are stricter. I think to a point, they do kind of trust us yeah. that we turn up with um, the right kit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I've saw, well, one farmer come in, they didn't even let him drive out, mainly mm. because he'd driven there by himself in it. Oh, right. Um, but yeah, he had a big lump of concrete in a cattle trailer that wasn't fastened down and then um, magnetic lights on the back of the trailer that weren't fulfilling the lighting requirements. Oh dear. Oh well. Okay, right, we've got um, uh, Parvash, we've, come with, we've already answered your question. You said, um, do you require to have to do CPC? For B plus E, no you don't. That's only for category C and category D. So no, you don't need D1, to C1 and D1 as well in that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything you can do can be CD, it's D1, D1E, C1E, etc. All that lot, all has to have CPC. Anything on the class two licenses, as they call it. So when we talk about class two licenses, we're not talking about HGV class two. That's why it's been scrapped and being classed as LGV um, licenses, uh, category C, category CE. Um, yeah. In the 2013 legislation that the uh, third European directive um, category one licenses is motorbikes and cars. Category two is everything else uh, vocational. So uh, a category two license needs CPC. That's the situation there. Um, now then, we're asked to drive right. along. Uh, 
Howard's the next one. Uh, he had a 600 litre IBC. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's the 600 line shot of it being 100% full. Yeah, because an IBC is designed to have what they call a nullage space to allow the expansion of the liquid inside while it's in transit. Right. Um, so technically, you can't get a 600 litre one, they're all 660. Um, but to be honest, I just fill mine up for an extra 60 kilo to stop the liquid moving. Um, I just do that. Um, I did uh, with one, um, I did used to fill it up to 600 and then yeah. I inflated an inner tube inside the IBC to take the space up. But my inner tube perished and got a puncture, so I, I York, Yorkshire and I couldn't buy another one. So I just <laughs> filled the water because that was three. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the phone going off here. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Uh, so the other one we have after that is uh, Howard, who um, is talking about driving along a measure line. Is that... Um, can you pick up this? That's John, not Howard. It's John. John. We're asked to drive along a measure line. Okay, uh, we're asked to drive along a measure line if we turn up with a different vehicle. That must be just something specific to the test centre you're using, John, because the ones I go to, all we've ever done is tell them it's X at length, and um, I've never had my vehicle measured. Um, I've seen them measure other people's when they've had doubt, um, but I must just have an honest face, I think. It's good to have one of those. I've got yeah. one as well. It's just you and me, I think, that's what it is. Well, yeah, that's how we're here. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, John, uh, question for you, Steve. It says, uh, what's your thoughts on being a member of the National Trader Associations? Um, I'm not a big fan of stuff like that anyway. I can understand kind of it helps get your name out and uh, they might be able to offer some sort of advice but I've never found it or felt it necessary to go down that route. Um, it, does, it does help with a little bit of recognition, but I think that's all it's for. You know, I, I think a lot of people start creating bodies that you can join um, just simply because they want to get their, their little bit of money out of you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's not necessary to do it. I mean, it's uh, if you've got the... Um, I mean, if you've got the confidence and competence and you keep reading things up, you should be able to do without it. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the main thing that I kind of try and put on my website and when I'm talking to people is emphasise the fact that I'm a DVSA qualified car instructor, because obviously mm -hmm. we don't do fraudulent advertising. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that means I have a good understanding of the DVSA systems. Yeah. And to be honest, when you talk to some of the examiners, they will say, we know who the exact the instructors are. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's point, your, your selling point. I mean, you were talking about the 2016 legislation that we got, it came to light this morning, that I found this morning. You know, um, ADIs can waive the three years because they have that extra... Um, yeah. Yeah, they, they can mitigate the risk, basically, can't they? They can do the scaling planning and the coaching skills as well, etc. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, any courses where I can train to become a B plus C trainer? I suppose really, really, it's go to a B plus C trainer, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I'll, I'll sort you out a price, Peter. Uh, but no, it is, um, yeah, just find someone who's willing. But um, it, I, I found it well. I mean, again, this is, this is quite bizarre. And I think this shows the profession, unprofessionalism of some of the people that do this is that on their websites, um, when they do videos of like uncouple, recouple and things like that, they will deliberately put faults in so people who try and learn off that will fail. So be careful who you ask for help with it. Yeah, the other thing is about marketing as well, because you said to me before about, uh, thank you, you said to me before about um, people advertising and marketing themselves as a DVSA accredited B plus E trainer, which is no such thing because mm. there is no B plus E register. No. So any ADI that is saying I'm a B plus C accredited trainer by the DVSA is actually false marketing. They could yeah. actually be done for it. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, it's even like people using RTITB. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I've been there. I don't put a lot of faith in them uh, as anything other than just a, a company. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's all these little names that get bandied about. You just want to talk to someone and find out who you think's honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Right, I've got uh, another one from Howard. He's uh, quite thickened with the uh, with the questions. Confused about maximum combined weight. I assume vehicle weight plus trailer weight plus load. Um, should this combined weight be under 3,500 kilos? Now, I assume he's talking about the trailer. No, the combined weight can be it's seven total thousand weight, thousand. isn't it? Combined yeah. tank is allowed to be three and a half ton towing vehicle and three and a half ton trailer. So combined weight can be seven tons. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the towing vehicle mustn't exceed three and a half tons. Because that's cat otherwise it goes out of category scope of category B. Yeah. And the trailer's maximum load now, tra trailer and load is not allowed to exceed 3,500 kilos. So you have a combination weight of seven tons. As a maximum. Yeah. As a maximum, yeah. Otherwise yeah. you go into category C one. C1E. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Well, okay. Um, uh, Nick is just qualifying. Um, I write the reversing area is 11 meters wide. Correct. Yes. Good. Okay. Fine. I think, Howard, as an ADI, I have B plus E grandfather rights. Um, we've already answered that one. Okay. Fine. That's okay. Right. I think. Is that it? I think that's all of it there. Unless there's anything else you want to add, Steve, at all? Uh, no, no. Um, um, there's some questions coming through on the chat, but I can't quite... Yeah, Graham is saying that, uh, so comply with regs, uh, the, the thing of compliance regs, you, if you, you can be a B plus E trainer as an ADI, if you have grandfather rights, you don't need to take um, a test, you can go straight into it. If you don't have the grandfather rights, then you must take a B plus E test. But if you are an ADI, you don't. You, you can waive the three year rule. That's what the situation is. Yeah. Yeah, there's some odd ones with that on higher categories as well, where if you failed um, certain, like a lorry license, and then you train or, and become a bus driver, you can then teach bus within a year if you've held LGV. There's yes, lots of weird little rules, and you've got to be careful how you read it. Yeah, and there's also things with sizes of trailers. You can do C1E training for trailers, and you can then go into a, a, a trailer behind a bus as well. But there's different size. Although you're allowed to do a certain size on the on the C1E of your license, you can't do the same size on the DE for some reason. I, and I again, it's something else that has to be looked up. It's a bit yeah. interesting. It is okay. Got, um, got a question. Okay. Um, yeah, Graham is saying opportunity for DIA to set up a formal register for this if the DVSA is doing nothing about it. Um, it's uh, something we've dis discussed, Graham, to be honest, about doing it because in the old days of the DIA, when Graham Fire was in charge, there was the um, DIART and, and ADITE, which were the two, which basically is what audit is now. Um, so it's not as if the DIA haven't done something similar to this before. And it has been has been mentioned. Um, it's just at the moment there's a, a lot of projects going on at the moment with um, DFT and other people. So it's uh, something that we can that we, we are looking at doing. Yeah, it'd be good to have something formalised. Um, yeah. yeah. To pull us away from the riffraff, basically, because that is my biggest bugbear with this: yeah. is that people with basically no idea and not even the gear yeah. will start doing it. And you look and um, I, I, I'm not going to quote anything, I don't know if I'm going to be on it, um, but you look at what some people are using and you think, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Leo's asked a question. Um, with the cost of the vehicle and trailer being quite high, does it pay well? Um, well, what, what, what define pay well. Um, yes, it does. Um, but it's the frequency of the work is the problem at the minute. Obviously, with COVID and lockdowns and restricted um, bookings um, because of the way they have to do it. Too, doesn't it? I mean, it's uh, if you're a situation where you're on the borders and you've got uh, mountain rescue and you've got forestry commission people and you've got that sort of thing, then also you're going to get a lot more work in those sort of areas. Yeah. So it yeah. does depend geographically located. You'd be surprised how many little sort of jobs people out there want this license. Um, and actually, yes, um, it does pay well. I mean, what I'd advise to Leo is, is actually just wherever you live, um, just go on the internet, have a look around. I mean, see, this is another thing. A lot of them don't put the prices up, but just do a dummy phone call and ask. 
um, and see what the charging and then you can kind of make your deductions from that. Um, I know with the courses I do and what I charge, um, I kind of do it as an all in price. I'm not VAT registered, so there's none of that to put on. And I just try and be upfront and honest and give myself a relatively decent wage out of it for the day. Um, but what I haven't done is put all my eggs in one basket. So during mm -hmm. these lean times, I can survive. Mm -hmm. I'll do webinars. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sophie just said she's in Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland, to do B plus E, you have to be an ADI and registered to the DVA. Now, DVA is the Northern Ireland equivalent yeah. of DVSA. I'll Although tell you what. We both work for the Department for Transport, the DVA is... Mm -hmm. Island oh, DVA is a lot more switched on than the oh, DVSA. Because even yeah. going back to CPC, which is a little bit off topic, it's all regulated by them. Yes. So the courses are approved, not the rubbish that we have over here. Yeah, it's nothing to do with jobs. It's completely different over there. That's yeah. right. They are. I, I wish we'd adopt that system. Yeah, yeah, like same here. Island. When I was over there, they're a lot more switched on with the taxi stuff over there as well. They've got, yeah. you know, I was over there years ago working, doing taxi stuff over there, training up ADIs, and their system is far stricter and far better run than it is over here. It really yeah. is far better. Oh, Sophie's in England. Sorry, sorry, Sophie. It's all right. <laughs> okay, well, what we do then, Steve, is uh, if you if you have anything else to add, there's a few more slides that we need Olivia to do um, for the DIA. So, um, is there anything else you want to add to this now? Is is that it? Um, no, I'm just kind of just canning back through the chat a little bit, and I yeah. think yeah, there is there is lots of work out in here. In fact, to be honest, when you go to the the test centres now. Um, B and E seems to be the mainstay of the work that the LGV test centres are doing. Yeah. Um, it, it just seems to keep going because there's a lot more people, obviously, that are 23 years now since it kicked in, um, yeah. have grown up, got families themselves, want a bigger caravan, doing different jobs, more responsibilities. Um, so the market has really grown in the last sort of like eight, nine years um so yeah it can support i think definitely more people um and so yeah that could help improve things i think but other than that i've finished right well thanks so much steve it's, it's been a great uh, having a chat with you it's uh, more than being a webinar it's been like a, a friendly chat really more than that we've sort of bounced off each other which i think in many respects is better for the people that are listening because it's it's more natural rather than fine uh, pre-proposed questions at each other so yeah. what i do then if that's all right I'll, I'll give you a call in a minute steve when we finish what i'll do okay I'll um, so olivia if you want to take over now then if that's okay and um uh if you can carry on please it's a few more slides after this shall do thank you steve thank you howard no problem thank you really interesting in content um so yeah we look forward to catching up with you afterwards thank you steve um okay so um just want to go through a couple of other bits and pieces with you guys um some of the usual slides that we just um, top and tail our, our webinars with. So part of the DI membership is um, the ADI support desk. Um, so we can obviously help you with any of your questions, queries, things like that um, on there. So as I say, that's mem this membership benefit only. So do um, consider that if you are wanting some help. Um, we have lots of courses, short courses, free courses, you know, uh, on our academy, quite a selection on there, different subjects. So do go on there and have a little look. Um, we have put a member offer out uh, for some free courses on there at the moment, giving you access. So that's on there. That is a different website to driving.org. So driving.org, you will find on there about your membership information, um, your membership uh, content, and also our COVID-19 content as well. So things like our post-lockdown toolkit, our infection control protocol, the course on there as well, which again, free for members, and also our COVID compliance mark as well. So we've got another webinar for next Friday, um, and this one we'll be doing with the Information Commissioner's Office. So we have some guest speakers, um, I believe there are three uh, ladies coming on to speak with us next week. Um, so we'll be looking at things like, you know, load of things data, uh, obviously. <laughs> um, we'll be looking at things like, um, should you be given, uh, should you be asked for a subject 
access request. Um, not too common, um, but that can happen. So how on earth, do, what is that and how do you respond to that? And um, be looking at things like um, the, the, the in-car cameras, dash cams, we'll be looking at some GDPR regs. Um, we'll be looking at, you know, what type of personal data. We'll be also looking at special category data um, as well. Uh, because that's emerged probably more this year through um, asking people about their health conditions and COVID and everything. So we will be asking some questions on that as well. So what we'd encourage you to do for ahead of next Friday is to email training at driving.org with any of your questions that you might have. Um, and that way we can um, share them with our panelists and we can um, get those questions answered for you. So do, do have a little uh, think about that. And if you're around next Friday, then that would be brilliant to have you on board with us again. Um, we are going to be recording it, of course. So you will be able to access all the recordings in our DIA Academy website. And this B plus E one, really interesting subject today. Um, that one will also be available probably early part of next week in the academy as well. So you can go and have a look, look in there. So I'll wrap up the session now just by saying to everybody, thank you very much for attending and giving your time today. We very much appreciate you, you being here. And um, thank you for joining us. And um, we wish you a great rest of your day and uh, speak to you soon. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs>